Hey, good morning. This is Chris with Suarez Home and Finance. Um, your Monday at 10 o'clock, Coffee with Chris. Um, so hopefully you've watched a few classes in the past. Um, we are on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all of the above. So um, if you've got any um, any questions or anything like that, just make sure and comment and, and so on and so forth on those platforms. Um, and then we're going to give you information at the end as well. So this morning, um, we have Jim Ivers, and he is with Capital Title Solutions. So I've worked with Jim for a long time and um, helped out on other deals, ironically, a couple weeks ago, um, just so happened to be in the same office and stepped right in to help us out and get a um, new home buyer um, into her home on a Friday afternoon. So um, because someone else, um, yeah, we had a snafu at the end. And so he jumped right in, got me documents printed, notarized, everything else. We're all good. So Jim is awesome. Um, so we asked Jim, what are the three things that he is asked um, most frequently? So um, we are going to jump right in. And so the first one is, um, what is a quick claim deed? So, and, and when they should be used. So really quick, before we get Jim to answer that question for us, um, we are going to ask Jim to explain exactly what a deed is. So in my eyes, the easiest way for me to say is it's kind of like a bill of sale whenever you buy a house. So Jim, what is the actual definition or whatever of it? Um, so, so that we know it's a, um, it's a transfer of ownership between two parties and okay. most of the time it's between individuals, but it can be between an LLC and a business or a corporation and another corporation. It all depends on, you know, who's involved in the transaction as to what type of deed. General warranty deeds are standard warrant are the standard deed for a regular individual to individual transaction. Special warranty deeds are more for like foreclosure transactions. So special warranty deed is only going to ensure from the time that that current person owned the property forward. It's not going to necessarily ensure prior to them because in a special warranty deed, obviously in a foreclosed property, bank's not going to know what happened in title prior to them taking ownership of the property. So those are the differences between a general and a special. And then a quick claim deed is, so say John and Mary Smith take title to a property, they buy a property as husband and wife, mm -hmm. and then something happens and they decide, okay, well, you know what, this isn't working out, they're getting divorced, and they need to take one of them off the title. Quick claim deed is the easiest way to do that where they can buy the forms themselves at either an office depot or staples. But in the case of a divorce, the divorce attorney may actually prepare it for them. It can be prepared by a real estate attorney. But like I said, it is something that if they're just, or if they're not getting divorced and just want it to be just in one person's name for whatever reason, they can buy the form themselves, fill it out, and then send it to the county for recording. Only caveat to that is, is if there's a mortgage on the house and they want to do that, that they're going to have to pay doc stamps on half of whatever the loan amount is on the property. So what that means is, so say they owe $100,000 on the property, they would have to pay transfer taxes or doc stamps on half of that. So <clears throat> they would have to pay transfer taxes on $50,000 of that loan that's out there. The county is going to know, because obviously the county is going to see that there's a mortgage out there. So they're going to know that if they're doing a quick claim deed and there's a mortgage out there, they're going to have to pay the doc stamps. You can't get away with it, unfortunately, because the county is going to know that if they're if they're searching public records, they're going to see there's a mortgage and they're going to know they have to be paid. Right. OK, so add one more thing in there. So there is a so with foreclosures, there's something that's called a certificate of title. Right. So Which certificate of title. So mm -hmm. what that is, is it's kind of like a deed. But what happens is it's a foreclosed property that goes through. A notice of uh, notice of list pendants, which is a notification to all parties that a property is being foreclosed on. So that may, puts everybody on notice. It mm -hmm. goes to a final summary judgment, which then obviously is to give the bank the ownership. They go through that. They go through a certificate of sale. End result is a certificate of title, which that is when the bank is awarded the property by the court. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So you, you kind of touched on a little bit. So what are quick claim deeds and when should they be used? So quick claim deeds are transfer of ownership mm -hmm. between two parties. And like I said, the best time to use them would be, so say you close on a property, 
in your name alone and you want to add your spouse after the fact. If it's a cash deal, it's easy enough to do where you can always do a quick claim deed. And like I said, you can mm -hmm. buy that in an Office Depot or Staples to form, fill it out yourself and submit it to the county for recording. And then there's no doc stamps, so just a recording fee, which would be like $18.50 to record it. Right. Um, if you're buying a house and you have a loan on the property, still same thing. So say you're buying a house and it's mom and child that are on the property the, together. And then the kid wants to take over ownership mm -hmm. of the property. Mom doesn't want to be on it anymore. If the kid does a refinance, which we've done in the past, where in a refinance transaction, we can prepare a quick claim deed to take mom off of title. Mm -hmm. We can't prepare quick claim deeds unless we're issuing an owner's title insurance, uh, unless we're issuing a title insurance policy, because it's considered an unauthorized practice of law if we try to prepare it without it, because it's a right. So and we can't prepare we them just for anybody. Right. And that's, we have to make sure we're issuing a policy. Okay. And that's where we refer them to, you know, whoever it is, whatever, refer them to, whether it's a real estate attorney or an attorney to prepare those. Right. Sometimes they'll, they'll type them up and for a minimal charge but then you know you go down and um record with the county and record them yourself okay right. all right and um so with that okay so i there there's a law that was passed i think last year or whatever that if you are adding a spouse then you don't pay the doc stamps on it correct um, is that the same if you're removing a spouse, like in a divorce? Yes, it would be the same. Well, no, it depends on if there's a loan on the house or not. So if mm -hmm. there's, if, if it's, if the spouse, if they're getting divorced and in the divorce decree, it says one spouse has to buy the other spouse out and that person is getting a loan, mm -hmm. then it's still half of the doc stamps on that new loan that have to be paid to the county. Mm -hmm. So we've done it where we do refinances all the time where like i said husband and wife own the house they've gotten divorced and part of the divorce is that one is going to stay in the house but they have to buy out the other spouse right. so in that case they have to prepare that quick claim deed and then it's half of whatever that new loan amount is would be the amount of transfer taxes that have to be paid to the county okay all right okay so there's which that which that law going into place has really helped a lot right because right. Like I've even been at closings and I've talked about it before that um, the they weren't married at the time. And well, why aren't I on the title or on mm -hmm. the deed and so on and so forth? And it's like, eek, you weren't on the contract. And so right. um, as far as buying, that's where it's very important. As far as if you own a home, then that's where, you know, you can do that. But again, you know, just like what what you're saying is that if you're not doing the title policy, it's not advisable, so to speak, I guess, um, to do a quick claim deed yourself because if the legal description is wrong, then you could cause a chain of, and it'd be a cloud on title at that point. Yeah. Right? And so it'd be a major it would, issue. Okay. Um, okay. So great. So um, let's go into your second one, your second question. So when do manufactured home titles need to be retired and when can they be transferred? So, um, in the, so I want to just make a note or whatever, and, and Gem and I have, have talked about this as well, but in Florida, um, people will say mobile, but they're always, whenever you're doing financing, it's considered a manufactured. So if you were to look up, you know, mobile home loan, you may find some, but a mobile home for, from what I've experienced for people up North, a mobile home is, um, well, a mobile home in Florida is more of a um, a manufactured home, but it's on wheels, right? Like in a um, in a uh, what do you call it? A park, uh, right. in a mobile, home, mobile park. home park, an RV park kind of deal. Yeah. So those you cannot get conventional financing on, so on and so forth, because it is still a mobile. It's got the A frame at the front of the trailer. It's got the wheels, everything else. So that is what in Florida we consider a mobile. So right. manufactured is a home that's on property. It's attached to the property by the legal description, by the property appraiser, everything else. So that is why the question comes up that Jim is going to elaborate on when do manufactured home titles need to be retired and when can they be transferred? So tell us that. So they can be transferred if it's a cash transaction because it's not required for them to be retired. Mm -hmm. But and 
as a title company, we don't, our underwriters require them to be transferred, which means that if the seller has the titles, we would have the seller sign the title over to the buyer because it's, it's like a car title. So it's along the same lines where it's yeah. a it's a title to a vehicle, just like if it was a car, mm -hmm. we'd have the seller sign it and then hand it to the buyer. Then we'd have the buyer sign a form stating that within 30 days from closing, they're going to take it to DMV and they're going to get it transferred to their name. And let me let me just ask you and just, let me just confirm. So it literally looks like a car title. Correct. It does. Literally. Exactly like a car title. OK. Yeah. And then if it's um, as far as for trans, uh, excuse me, for retiring, most of the time it's when it's a lender transaction, if it's not considered real property by the property appraiser, mm -hmm. then the lender is going to require that the title be retired and it then be classified as real property because without being classified as real property, a lender, like you said, won't loan money on it because right. at that point it's not considered land and a, a house, it's considered a vehicle. So then it's like <laughs> a car loan. Kind of, right. sort of kind of <laughs> along those lines. Okay. So when, when we've had this before and it's not happened in quite a long time, because now there's third party companies that do, you know, do right. the, the, the research or the legwork for you is that a long time ago that if you had, if you bought a home that the mobile home manufactured home titles were not retired, you had to go and hunt down the seller and the previous seller and this and that and everything else, whatever, to go get title, to go get the actual car title looking thing. Right. Or you had to go down to the DMV and get them. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. But That's now, nice part about now mobile home title services is pretty much, I, I would say they probably do for just about every title company in Florida because yeah. they actually have all the paperwork necessary to get all that stuff done. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap, but at the same time, it's more convenient for everybody in that kind of a situation. So even in a cash transaction, if the seller doesn't have the title, same thing, then we'd reach out to mobile home title services, have them prepare the documentation to then have the titles transferred from the seller to the buyer. Because as a title company, we don't insure those mobile homes because technically they're still considered mobile homes. Right. But our underwriters requiring that if it's going to be considered something that's going to be still on the property, then we want to make sure those titles are transferred from one owner to the other. Right. And, and as far as whenever you're doing, so whenever you're buying a manufactured, when you're doing financing, it's required to have what's called an Alta 7 and to have an affidavit of a fixation. Correct. Um, and so that is, that is required if the titles are not previously retired. Right. Um, what is so that's where sometimes it's caught us off guard as far as you know closing costs and financing and stuff like that so one thing is that i just want to throw in there is that you know if somebody is selling a manufactured or somebody's buying a manufactured you know does the real estate agent you know they call the title company or you know they find out if the time if the manufactured home titles have been retired if not, then do you negotiate on that sales price or, you know, do you negotiate on, you know, the seller providing that or paying half of that or whatever? What is the normal cost for that? So normal cost is about, it's between three and $400 on both sides. Okay. Depending on, oh, depending on, on where the property, depending on what county it's in, it depends on the cost. It's usually, uh, it's stay standards between three and $400 on both sides. Oh, so okay. it's usually a little cheaper for the seller than it is for the buyer, but okay that's usually about the standard fees on so seller might be like about 300 and seller buyer would be about 400. okay i did actually i wasn't aware that the seller had any cost on that already up front and so that's why i mentioned that so okay so just be prepared if you're buying a manufactured home and the titles aren't retired then you're going to have that additional cost which Correct. there are additional costs whenever you buy a manufactured home anyways and that's a whole nother that's a whole nother coffee with chris right um, exactly <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole nother thing that's a whole nother story <laughs> yeah so okay so then um okay so then you you have the cost on both sides right. um they are i know that they are required as far as a as as far as if you're getting financed um, but they're not required if you're buying a cash deal. Right. It's not okay. required to be retired. So it's still required. For, our underwriter still requires it to be transferred. Right. If it's considered still a manufactured home and there's still the title out there, then mm -hmm. it, like I said, then we need to either make sure that either the seller has the original title and they're going to sign it over to the buyer. Or we, again, we reach out to mobile home title services and say, hey, guess what? We have this situation. Can you search and see if you can either find the title? 
and then take care of transferring it for both sides. And then we obviously will let buyer and seller know, hey, guess what? This has to be done. And mm-hmm. this is what the cost is. I just had one actually on Friday that that, that happened to. It was a for sale by owner. Mm-hmm. Gentleman didn't have the title. So then we obviously reached out to Mobile Home Title Services to see if it had been retired or not. Had not been retired. So then I talked to the buyer and I said, okay, well, right now we've got it set up where we're going to transfer title from obviously the seller to you. Do you want to go forward with that or do you want it to be retired? He right. said, no, I want it to be retired. It did cost him like another hundred bucks because there's an extra step on Mobile Home Title Services part. Mm-hmm. But he wa- he was thinking in the long term because he's buying it as an investment. He's going to fix it up. And then when he goes to sell it, he won't have to worry about titles will already be retired and he won't have to worry about going through this all over again and having another expense to him or the new buyer. Right. He tried okay. to eliminate that ahead of time by doing it now. Now, when you do that, um, if the if they're if the titles are not retired, how does the property appraiser still tax it the same way? They will tax it as mobile home. So when you go onto the property appraiser's website, the property card will let you know if it's still considered a mobile home, it will say that. If it's a considered single family residence, it will say single family. There are what they call RP decals, which means real property. So if those are on the mobile or manufactured home somewhere, mm-hmm. that is a way to know if it's been retired or not without having okay. to go through that expense. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, okay. So that, that answers a whole bunch of stuff on that part because in Florida, we do have a lot of manufacturers. Right. Um, and we've had a lot of them come up lately. That was the other reason why I thought it was a good topic because we've, I've seen quite a few lately. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think part of that is because there's just not a lot people are turning to those because there's not a lot of single families out there either. Right. Right. So looking for alternative. Right. Um, so, okay. So our next question is, and this, I have no idea. So what <laughs> does FIRPTA, F-I-R-P like Paul, T like Tom, A stands for, and what does it mean in a real estate mm-hmm. transaction? So first, FERPTA is um, Foreign Investment in Real Estate Property Tax Act is what it stands for. And what hey, that is. Fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so a Foreign Investment in Real Estate, um, sorry, in Real Property Act. Okay. Is what it is. <laughs> so um, it's for foreign sellers. So if they don't have a social security number, so okay. say you have a Canadian seller who has a house or vacant piece of land in the state of Florida that they're trying to sell. That act requires that we withhold 15% of the gross sales price of the trans of the property of the transaction from the seller to send to the IRS as taxes. Okay. Oh, okay. So if it's, and then it goes a little bit more in depth as far as if the buyer is going to be living in it and it's a primary residence and the sales price is less than $300,000, the, we would present it to the buyer and say, okay, well, seller's a foreign entity. However, there is government law that says that if you're going to sign this form for us that says you're going to, it's going to be your primary residence, sales price is less than $300,000, we don't have to withhold that 15% from the seller. But that's up to the buyer because then it's, it's to let the buyer know that it's a tax, obviously it's a tax type of situation. It's got to involve the IRS. So, and the buyer can say, no, I don't want to sign that form, in which case then we still have to hold that 15%. Okay, so back up because I may have missed it. So why so why would a buyer have the capability of saying yes or no? And then if they said no. So if they say so if they say yes, they want to sign that form, then there's no there's no consequence to the seller. The seller, we don't have to collect that 15% from the seller as um, withholding for federal government for the federal government. But I always err on the side of caution and always will still obviously let them know, hey, look, you know, because the seller is foreign, it's 15% of the gross sales price that has to go to the IRS. It's not a tax implication to them at all as far as if something were to happen. It's their primary residence, so the IRS can't do anything to them. But very rarely, and obviously nowadays, do we have properties that are being sold that are less than the $300,000 where it's a primary residence. If it's a vacant piece of land, same thing. It's still going to apply because it's vacant land. So anytime it's anything other than a primary residence and anytime sales price is more than $300,000, that 15% has to be withheld from the seller and it's got to be calculated based on the the gross sales price. And then we send that to the IRS. 
And then the IRS decides there's some forms, um, two forms that have to get completed. 8288 and 8288A are two forms that need to go with that payment to the IRS. And then the IRS gets all that information. And mm-hmm. then they'll make the decision as to if that whole amount has to be paid to them or depending on the seller's qualifications and how they are, what they're registered as depends on how much of that they'd actually keep. And then they might refund some of it back to the seller. But by law, we have to collect that 15%. Okay. All right. I didn't know that, but okay. So that kind of, that kind of makes a difference on what they're selling it for too. Right. Because they've not only got that 15%, then they've got, you know, real estate commission, they've got everything else or whatever that they're taking into consideration. But that's, that is something that's definitely a cost when they go to sell it. Right. Correct. But, but it's not an implement, um, I'm saying the wrong word. It's not a, it doesn't affect the buyer as far as the buyer is not going to have to pay that tax or anything like that. Right. That's why, that's why we make sure the buyer knows that if, if it's going to be their primary residence, sales price is under $300,000. As long as they're willing to sign that form stating that it is going to be their primary residence, mm-hmm. they need, that's why we bring it to the buyer. Because it's like, well, if it's not going to be your primary residence, you don't want to sign that form. Because if the IRS finds out it wasn't your primary residence, then you're going to have to pay that tax. Yeah. Okay. So we want to make sure that the buyer knows that it's got to be their primary residence. Okay. If it's not going to be their primary residence, then that 15% we withhold from the seller. And then make sure the IRS gets paid by that. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that, that I, I understand it now. I've not had it happen, um, but it normally would not be something that I would see anyways. Right. Um, but I have heard of it before. So, um, okay. All right. Well, that's good. Um, so we've got a few minutes left. Mm-hmm. And, and so d- is there anything else that, you know, you would give advice on people as far as, okay, so let's go into, you know, somebody's buying a, you know, a cash transaction, mm-hmm. you know, and they write it down on a napkin or whatever the case is. Um, you still want to get title insurance. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. And, and I'm, I'm assuming that they got title insurance or they got part of it or something. I have a client right now that has bought some property um, and the seller, and I think I'm saying this right, the seller bought it on a tax sale and they turned around and sold it. My clients bought it, um, but they didn't do the quiet title Mm. on it. And so now they have to wait four years before mm-hmm. they can do anything with it to have clear title. Correct. <clears throat> so it's funny. I actually have a similar situation with one of my agents that gentleman is look interested in buying a property that same thing. It was a tax deed where the person that is now currently wanting to sell it, bought it via tax deed. We did a title search and there is, like you said, that quiet title action, which because of the fact that there was never title search done and chain of title wasn't done correctly, Mm-hmm. Tax deeds are just simply that. It's a tax deed showing that somebody paid so much for the property taxes on a house. And in turn, the tax collector, the, the county issues a tax deed to now show they own it. But that's not actually showing that if there's any issues in title. So in this case, I actually just looked at the commitment this morning. It does call for a quiet title action because the prior owner that is in title <clears throat> prior to any tax deed, they were trustees of a trust. So- mm-hmm that's going to be one of those things where you've got beneficiaries that might be out there that might have claims on the property. Even if that person's not alive anymore, as far as the regular trustee, their heirs might still have claims to that property. So that's the reason for that quiet title action is to make sure there are no heirs or anybody out there that can claim ownership of that property as an heir to that person. And that's, and that you, is there a shorter time than the four years? (sighs) If they want to spend the money to get a quiet title action done, I just actually had one. It took us about a year to do a quiet title action. So with the, as long as a quiet title action is done and the court approves it, it can be done within a year. I mean, if the, if the, if the parties are willing to pay the fees to get it done, it right. is something that can be done. You know, obviously they have to go to a real estate attorney to do it, but Real estate attorney would take care of, you know, all the necessary steps that they have to do to um, to make sure there's no heirs, make sure there isn't anybody that can take owners, claim ownership of the property. And like I said, ours, it was it was almost a year to the day that the contract was signed before we closed. We actually just closed it on Friday. Contract was signed a year ago. That's past Saturday. So almost wow. a year to the day, we finally were able to close because the quiet title action was done. And it was a similar situation where 
it was tax deed and the people that had owned it prior to our sellers had a um actually it was a deed with um with a mortgage out there mm -hmm. so the, the sellers held the mortgage and then once the mortgage had been paid off they were supposed to then turn around to do a warranty deed from them to the then buyers which they never did so the people that were the sellers still technically own the house because they never did a deed to right. the buyers so those people's heirs if they had any still had the capability to take ownership of the property so that's what the quiet title took forever for is they had to make sure there was nobody out there for either one of those parties that can actually claim ownership before they could then turn around and sell it okay because i was thinking that i because the one that i've got right now whatever they said four years but i was thinking that there was something that could be done like in four or six months yeah well like i said it depends on the it depends four to six months is standard time. The one year was kind of a little bit longer than we would have liked <laughs> to have it happen. <laughs> normally, the, normally quiet titles usually within four to six months, depending on the court, depending on the judge, depending okay. on the attorney. It all depends on who's involved and how quickly they can, you know, do their stuff to get right. it done. Okay. So a lot of variables, right? A lot of variables. Yeah. Okay. But like I said, if they don't do the quiet title action, I'm pretty sure you're right. It is about four years before they can do anything without doing the quiet title. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's there's, there's evidently a company that has done this repeatedly and selling it to people. And so, you know, people are buying it unknown, you know, buying a piece of land cash and, you know, unknown or whatever else. And so, um, yeah, again, a, another reason to go with a title company so that even if you are paying cash to where, you know, that you're walking into that tie into that property with, without anything behind you is what I call somebody else's junk, somebody else's right. crap behind, you know, right. from in front right. of you. Right. Exactly. So, okay. Well, I appreciate your time on here. And um, so, so again, this you. is um, Jim and with Capital Title um, Solutions. And um, so I know that you're in Hernando County and I know that you're in Pasco. Yeah, we're also this? in Hillsborough County. We you're actually have our main offices in Trinity. We have okay. an office in Spring Hill and we have an office in uh, Tampa on McDill. All okay. three offices are inside of a Remax office. We are owned by the, um, the broker who's the broker owner of the Remax Alliance Group. Okay. All right. So if you've got any other questions for Jim, um, his information will be posted on here as well. Um, Jim, just go ahead and shout out what your what your number is and your email just in case they've got any, you know, anybody's got any sure. further questions or whatever that they can turn around and ask you. Sure. So email is Jim at Capital Title Solutions dot com. And then phone is um, 727-807-2229. And I'm okay. option one in that wonderful little ma machine. Yeah. <laughs> Or his zero and you like that answers the phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So okay. Well, and and again, this will be on you know YouTube, social media, everything else, or whatever. And we'll share it with you, Jim, as well, so you can share it with you know your your clientele, your people, um, right. your company, and everything else, or whatever. Again, it's we just I just like giving information out there that um, is a little bit more education than what you had to begin with and um, learn something new every day. Heck yeah, exactly. So I hope you all have a happy Monday um, and thanks so much for watching and thanks Jim for coming on and we will talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Okay. Bye.